Good morning. It's Aya Wimala, and uh, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, and I have, I'm very excited about what I'm going to read to you today while we meditate. Um, I was cleaning out books yesterday and trying to organize and rearrange and trying to find everything I could get rid of, and I have a very small, <laughs> very tiny stack of things that I think I can get rid of, but the rest are still in my library, but at least they're arranged better. Um, I found something in one of the books I was going through. I have a lot of Thich Nhat Hanh's books, and I have one that's a collection of three of his books. It's called The Wisdom of Thich Nhat Hanh. And I have a beautiful chapter. This is from Being Peace. Um, that I want to share with you today, and we can do it while we're sitting so you can just listen to me. I think it's um, it's very relevant to everything that I see when I'm working with people. Um, there are often so many problems within families where we have difficulties with one of our loved ones, and we can't we can't fix it. And I've seen more suffering, I think, and really suffering in the sense of um, just being at a complete roadblock and being unable to work with someone we dearly love and we feel like we've lost them. We feel like a failure. Um, we feel the, the hurt can just be continuing. It can be it may be something that we know we don't have any expectations of it getting better, but we agonize over it. So I, this is beautiful, and I think it can be so helpful too, even when we're talking to people going through something like this. So I'm going to read that. The other thing is, I often have people asking me, um, how do they meditate more in their busy lives? Or do they need to go away to retreats? Do they need to, you know, how many hours a day should they spend and what time they should meditate? And I think this talks about, gives one answer to that question. And I, I don't think people have to feel like they have to go away for long retreats. There may come a time in your life where that just feels like you're so drawn to it and you have the time and it's not creating problems. Uh, with the people you care for. I think there's a time when that can be a beautiful thing and a beautiful way to spend uh, free time away from work, away from our everyday uh, busyness. But um, you'll know when that time is right. You'll, you don't have to pressure yourself. I think a lot of what we see in the West are a lot of people who have the, the uh, extra income to go on long retreats and they it's a way they do vacations or travel. Uh, it may be the kind of practice they're in if they're in like the Goenka Vipassana practices. But don't feel pressure thinking that you're not a good meditator or you're, you're missing out on uh, attaining enlightenment if you don't go on long retreats. So many of you are busy and you have jobs and you have families and so taking off that kind of time to go on long retreats can become a real problem. You can meditate at home, you can do a, a day retreats or a weekend retreat if you'd like to take that time and just focus on your practice and if, if you can feel that you come back uh, and feel good coming back. You don't feel exhausted, you don't feel uh, worn out, you don't feel like you're coming back home to a lot of uh, difficult people. Uh, weekend retreats can be very refreshing and can help uh, give you that, that's like a, a boost. But don't stress over not being able to go to long retreats. It, it's, that's not ne it isn't necessary, but we can structure our lives to be uh, encouraging our practice. So I'm going to, let's all sit in our meditation posture. 
so you're relaxed and comfortable whether you're on the floor or in a chair. Good morning. And um, you can gently close your eyes or leave them open, but let your, let your uh, eyes be downcast if they're open so you're not too distracted or uh, tempted to let them start wandering around. If you can be outside, that would be wonderful. So just begin breathing. I heard a wonderful thing, a Christian minister uh, who was talking on public radio just briefly, she, or she lost her own son just two years ago, so she said she can't be that active in the protest and uh, being out in the streets with people in her community because it just, she's still healing. But she said what she does tell people all the time and what her advice is to people who are protesting or if you're at home and you're uh, doing what you can from a distance, she said, and she's a Christian minister, so this is even more touching for me, what she tells people is to Pray and meditate and breathe. And probably better in this order, breathe, meditate, and pray. And I thought, well, that's about the best three, three words of advice anybody could have, right? So just remember that, breathe, meditate, pray. And I think that fits in with what I'm reading today. And we can do the... We need to be doing the breathing all the time, not letting our strong emotions stop that, and also let each breath be full of gratitude. You are breathing. You can breathe. So breathe, meditate, pray. And this is called, this is from Thich Nhat Hanh, and it's from being peace, and it's the beginning of a chapter called Meditation in Daily Life. Just close your eyes and breathe, and this may be, this may be something you would like to hear today. During retreats from time to time, a bell master invites the bell to sound, silently reciting this poem first body, speech, and mind in perfect oneness. I send my heart along with the sound of the bell. May the hearer awaken from forgetfulness and transcend all anxiety and sorrow. Then the bell master, he or she breathes three times. and invites the bell to sound. When the rest of us hear the bell, we stop our thinking and breathe in and out three times, reciting this verse. Listen, listen. This wonderful sound brings me back to my true self. Listen, listen, this wonderful sound brings me back to my true self. Meditation is to be aware of what is going on in your body, in your feelings, in your mind, and in the world. The most precious practice in Buddhism is meditation, and it is important to practice meditation in a joyful mood. We have to smile a lot in order to be able to meditate. The bell of mindfulness helps us to do this. 
Suppose we have a son who becomes an unbearable young man. It may be hard for us to love him. That is natural. In, or in order to be loved, a person should be lovable. If your son has become difficult to love, we will all be very unhappy. We wish we could love him, but the only way we can is to understand him, to understand his situation. We have to take our son as the subject of our meditation. Instead of taking the concept of emptiness or some other subject, we can take our son as a com concrete subject for our meditation. First, we need to stop the invasion of feelings and thoughts, which deplete our strength and might in meditation, and cultivate the capacity the power of concentration. In Pali or Sanskrit, this is called samadhi. For a child to do his homework, he has to stop chewing gum and stop listening to the radio so he can concentrate on the homework. If we want to understand our son, we have to learn to stop the things that divert our attention Concentration, samadhi, is the first practice of meditation. When we have a light bulb for the light to concentrate on our book, we need a lampshade to keep the light from dispersing, to concentrate the light so that we can read the book more easily. The practice of concentration is like acquiring a lampshade to help us concentrate our mind on something. While doing sitting or walking meditation, cutting the future, cutting the past, dwelling in the present time, we develop our own power of concentration. With that power of concentration, we can look deeply into the problem. This is insight meditation. First, we are aware of the problem, focusing all our attention on the problem. And then we look deeply into it in order to understand its real nature. In this case, the nature of our son's unhappiness. We don't blame our son. We just want to understand why he has become like that. Through, his method of, through this method of meditation, we find out all the causes near and far that have led to our son's present state of being. The more we see, the more we understand. The more we understand, the easier it is for us to have compassion and love. Understanding is a source of love. Understanding is love itself. Understanding is another name for love. Love is another name for understanding. When we practice Buddhism, it is helpful to practice in this way. When you grow a tree, it does not, if it doesn't grow well, you don't blame the tree. You look into the reasons it is not doing well. You may need fertilizer or more water or less sun. You never blame the tree, yet we blame our son. If we know how to take care of him, he will grow well like a tree. Blaming has no effect at all. Never blame. Never try to persuade using reason and arguments. They never lead to any positive effects. That is my experience. No argument, no reasoning, no blame, just understanding. If you understand and you show that you <clears throat> and you show that you understand, you can love and the situation will change. The bell of mindfulness is the voice of the Buddha calling us back to ourselves. We have to respect that sound. <clears throat> Stop our thinking and talking and go back to ourselves with a smile and breathing. It is not a Buddha from the outside. It is our own Buddha calling us. If we cannot hear the sound of the bell, then we cannot hear other sounds which also come from the Buddha like the sound of the wind, the sound of the bird, 
even the sounds of cars or a baby crying. They are all calls from the Buddha to return to ourselves. Practicing with a bell is helpful, and once you can practice with a bell, you can practice with the wind and other sounds. After that, you can practice not only with the sounds, but with forms. The sunlight coming through your window is also a calling from Dharmakaya for the Buddha Kaya to be, and also for the Sangha Kaya to be real. Calming, smiling, present moment, wonderful moment. When you sit, you can recite this, and while doing walking meditation, you can use it or other methods like counting. Breathing in one, breathing out one. Breathing in two, out two. In three, out three. Go up to 10. You know, my recommendation is just go up to five. Go up, but uh, Thich Nhat Hanh says until 10, and then you decrease 10, and then nine, eight, seven. Counting the breath is one of the ways to educate yourself for concentration, samadhi. If you do not have enough concentration, you cannot be strong enough to break through, to have a breakthrough into a subject of your meditation. Therefore, breathing, walking, sitting, and other practices are primarily for you to realize some degree of concentration. This is called stop. Stop in order to concentrate. Just as the lampshade stops the light from dispersing, so you can read your book more easily, the first step of meditation is stopping. Stopping the dispersion, concentrating on one subject. The best subject, the most available subject, is your breathing. Breathing is wonderful. It unites body and mind, whether you count breaths or just follow them. It is for stopping. Stopping and seeing are very close. As soon as you stop, the words on the page become clear. The problem of our son becomes clear. Stop and look. That's meditation, insight meditation. Insight means you have a vision an insight into reality. Stopping is also to see, and seeing helps to stop. The two are one. We do so much. We run so quickly. The situation is difficult. And many people say, don't just sit there, do something. But doing more things may make the situation worse. So you should say, don't just do something, sit there. Sit there, stop, be yourself first, and begin from there. That is the meaning of meditation. When you sit in the meditation hall at home or wherever you are, you can do that, but you have to really sit. Just sitting is not enough. Sit and be. Sitting without being is not sitting. Be stopping and seeing. I think we'll stop there. How can, let's, let me just read the last of this paragraph. How can we stop? We have to resist the speed, the losing of ourselves, and therefore we must organize a resistance. Spending two hours on one cup of tea during a tea meditation is an act of resistance, nonviolent resistance. We can do it because we have a Sangha. We can do it together. We can resist a way of life that makes us lose ourselves. Walking meditation is also resistance. Sitting is also resistance. So if you want to stop the course of armaments, you have to resist and begin by resisting in your own daily life. I saw a car from New York with a bumper sticker. 
Let peace begin with me. That's correct. And let me begin with peace. That is also correct. Well, if you're still sitting, you can open your eyes. Ah, isn't that beautiful? Um, it's good to go through your books once in a while. There's, there are just jewels there that we've maybe even read in the past and we, we're ready to really hear them. We're really to, ready to really understand them more deeply. So breathe, meditate, and pray. Contemplate, resist, and resist by having samadhi, by stopping. And that samadhi, samadhi is that coalescing of everything into a still pointed spot. As you go out for your day, I want to read something. I've read this before, but I think this is a, a good, good way. Let's tie all this up. What are my intentions for today? On behalf of myself and all beings, I intend to refrain from consciously hurting anyone. I intend to refrain, refrain from overtly or, covert, or covertly taking what is not mine. I intend to be sure that my speech is kind as well as true. I intend to refrain from addictive behaviors that confuse my mind and lead to heedlessness. So everyone, thank you so much for uh, being with me and I hope there's something that really speaks to you today. And I do want to say um, it's just beautiful to have you in my life and to have you in my practice. Okay, thank you.